And I'm, I'm glad that you're here. We're going to be continuing on with our series that we started a couple weeks ago, talking about the ABCs, the ABCs of stewardship. And, and what we've been learning in this, and why we started this series, is because we said that we want to understand what true biblical stewardship looks like, what good stewardship looks like. And we've learned a lot in the past couple weeks about it when it comes to stewardship, stewardship of our time, stewardship of our gifts, stewardship of our finances. We've learned, the biggest thing that we've learned is it doesn't matter how much time you give to God. It doesn't matter how much, you know, how many ministries you're plugged into. It doesn't matter, uh, matter how much money you're giving to the church. If our attitude, if our hearts aren't correct, and that's, that's what we have forgotten. And I think one of the reasons we struggle with understanding what it looks like to be a good steward in our life, especially when we come to our talking about our finances and, and stuff like that, is because we struggle with understanding the law and grace. You know, do we live under the law or do we live under grace? You know, is, is, is it a law when it comes to this biblical stewardship or is it grace by how we do that? And that's what I want us to learn and understand because you see, you know, the law was given to Moses and we know that in the Old Testament we see how it was given to him and then Christ came and Christ gave us grace. But then again we ask the question, what's the difference? And I think it's because we struggle with understanding the difference that we struggle with understanding what it means to be a good steward with all that God has given us within our life. Back in the 70s, in the police department in the state of Connecticut, they had a regulation, they had a rule, they had a law that after the first snow that all of their vehicles had to have chains put on. Now for some of you, again, I'll have to explain, chains are things that when it snows, it's bad weather, you put on your tire. Literally, chains that go over the tires you have to put on there. You don't see it as much with the kind of tires they make today. They're not, you know, as needed as much, you know, when it comes to that aspect. They're still out there, but you don't see a lot of that out there today. But back in the 70s, at this particular police department, it was a requirement. And then they'd had this first snow, and then another bad snowstorm came, and all of a sudden the police department received a call from a lady, and, and she said, I want to let you know one of your officers at the end of our street here was in, a bat, well, was in a wreck, and his car is upside down. And the dispatch asked, well, is everybody okay? And she said, well, I think so, but the officer's acting a little odd. He's standing on top of his car trying to get the chains on his back tires, you know. And when you think about that and you understand that, why was that police officer doing that after the accident? Because he should have had him on before. The regulations, the rule, the law said, this is when you're supposed to have him on. And he realized, whoops. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I didn't follow the law. I didn't follow the regulations. And because of that, I'm going to get in trouble. So he was trying to put them on at that point, even though it wasn't going to help in any way, shape, or, or form. There, there was a price to be paid for his negligence there. And I don't know what that penalty was. I don't know what the price is. I don't know what the punishment was that happened to him. But, you know, he, it was enough that it caused him to get out after an accident. How injured he was, I don't know, to get and stand on his car and attempt to put those on. So as, as we understand the law and as we understand grace and as we try to understand what the difference is today, uh, I, I want us to understand this first thing. If you're taking notes, I hope you are, that any law, any law that we have out there in order to be, you know, effective, it has to have penalties. Any law has to have penalties if we want it to be effective. And John tells us when we read through the Gospels that God gave the law through Moses. And this is what we read in Exodus 19, starting in verse 9. We read these words. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in, in a dense cloud so the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and concentrate them, consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not go up the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Whether man nor animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they go up to the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and, he, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. So from the very moment that the law of Moses was given to the people, the second it was given that God gave it, there was 
penalties that came with it. Remember? No, but doesn't matter whether you're animal, doesn't matter whether you're human. Anybody goes up and anybody touches the foot of it, they are going to die. Now, why does there need to be penalties with the laws? Why is it if we want a law to be effective, there has to be consequences or penalties that come with it? The reason is, is because if there's not, we're probably not going to follow it. And that nobody's going to pay attention to the law. I don't know if you've ever done this, but, you know, in each community and, and stuff around that over the years, you know, every community, every district, every place, every state and all that, you know, they have laws that they put on the books. They create these laws, you know, you can't do this and can't do that. The thing is, in a lot of these communities, as time goes on, they forget to take some of these outdated laws off the books. And so you can actually go and research, and I did that this week. I, I did research some laws, especially ones that pertain to church and Sunday and what, you know, the Sabbath and stuff like that. These are laws that I'm about to tell you. These laws are actually still on the books in these communities, that if somebody wanted to, because these laws are on the books and they're still active laws, they could come after somebody with these crazy laws here. But here's one. Young girls are never allowed to walk a tightrope in Wheeler, Mississippi, unless it's in a church. I know, ridiculous. I mean, I don't know if they think like the church is the best place because they fall and die, they're going to heaven because they're in church. I don't know, but it's a law. It's still on the books. Here's one. In Blackwater, Kentucky, <laughs> tickling a woman under her chin with a feather duster while she's in church service carries a $10 penalty and one day in jail. I don't know how many guys carry around or women have that, carry around a feather duster in their pocket so when they go to church they can tickle ladies under the chin. But it must have been a big thing there with it because they made a law that it couldn't happen in that in Blackwater. Or no one can eat unshelled roasted peanuts while attending church in Idenha, Oregon. Maybe they can eat shelled roasted peanuts, just not unshelled roasted peanuts, I don't know. And in Honey Creek, Iowa, no one's permitted to carry a slingshot to church except the police. I like that law. <clears throat> I still like that one right there. Or, no citizen in, in, in Lee Creek, Arkansas is allowed to attend church in any red-colored garment. Because we know red is what? Yeah, that's how he dresses. So no one can come in with that, you know. And I love this one. Turtle races are not permitted within 100 yards of a local church at any time in Slaughter, Louisiana. All these laws are still on the book, but do you think people still abide by these laws? Number one, probably because they have forgotten about them. But number two, they're not enforced. There's no penalty. There's no consequences. Because you see, the purpose of a law, remember what the purpose of a law is. It's to help us understand what is acceptable and what isn't. The law is kind of like where it draws a line in the sand and says, you cannot cross here. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. If you do cross this line here, if you do decide to do this or to do that, there's going to be consequences. There are going to be penalties paid. See, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever heard of something called a speeding ticket? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you are moaning that raise your hand, meaning you might have actually received one. I didn't ask how many of you have received a speeding ticket. If your hand was up confessing that, thank you for that public confession. I just want to make sure you'd heard of them and what they were as I gave this illustration. And that, But uh, several years ago when Melinda and I lived in Iowa, this was pre-kids. And that, uh, so we hadn't been back there maybe a year at the most. And uh, one of Melinda's friends that she had known forever, Joe and Carol, uh, they were missionaries overseas. They had come back on furlough. And they were coming through Iowa, and they stopped to see us. Well, this is about the same time that the movie Twister. Remember the movie Twister that came out? The tornado and everything that came through. And, and at the end of the movie Twister, this F5 comes just barreling through, and they're doing this kind of thing. And they find himself at this farmhouse, and then it dissipates and goes away. And they show the farmer and his wife, and that come out of the cellar and say, look, the house is still there. It didn't take the house. Well, that was actually shot in just a little part far out of uh, Boone, Iowa, not far from where we lived. That scene that was right there. And they left that house and everything looking just like that so people can go and see where the movie was made. And Joe had seen the movie, and Joe wanted to go see that site. So we hop in the car, and we're going through these back roads looking for this place. And, and we're driving down this two-lane road, you know, and we come to this car that, that's not going as fast as I would like it to go. And it's in a long straightaway with a hill in the distance. And so I decide to pass the car. I turned on my turn signal and I went out into the other lane and I'm going and as I look, you know, in the distance over the hill, here comes a highway patrol officer. So I'm being very nice and I speed up and I swing in, you know, to get out of the way and stuff like that. And just as he comes by me, he points at me, flips on his lights. 
turns around and pulls me over. And I end up getting a $75 ticket. Now I'll let you think on that and sit on that about why in the world after I was so nice to get out of his way that he decided to stop and pull me over and give me a $75 ticket. And we'll come back to that. But here's the question I want to ask. Is the law that we're talking about, is the law good? And the second thing I want us to understand that yes, laws are good. They are there to protect us from individuals that want to do wrong. They exist to protect us from people who endanger others because they're in a hurry. The law that that Connecticut officer, you know, disregarded about the chains on his vehicle, it existed to protect him and his vehicle from the very type of accident that he had gotten in in the first place. So yes, laws themselves, laws are basically good, but laws do have a couple weaknesses. First of all, while yes, laws exist to protect us, they don't necessarily make us better citizens. They don't necessarily make us better people. And what I mean by that is, if we don't want to obey the law, we don't, right? Did I understand why I got pulled over? Do you understand why I got pulled over? I did. See, the law is this. When you go to pass somebody, you cannot speed to pass somebody. I was on a two-lane highway. The, the, the speed limit is 55. The car I came up to, it was doing 55. I just didn't like that it was going 55. So I decided to press the gas. I didn't even know this little Honda Accord that we drove with four people could go that fast with this four-cylinder engine, you know. And I get out around it, and I think I'm doing a good thing when I see the officer, and I gas it even more to get around out of his way, and I ended up speeding to the point that I get a $75 ticket. Did I know that was speeding? Yep, I knew it, you know. Did the Connecticut state policeman know what the law was? Yep. That's why after the accident, he was standing on top of his car trying to get the chain on there. And if we try and find a way around it, it, it doesn't do us any good either. There was a, uh, uh, some enterprising group of college students that literally tried to manage time. And that uh, and the, in the college that they were going to, as, as many colleges even today have, is they had a rule, they had a regulation, they had a law that said if they came to the class and if the professor was 15 minutes late or more, they could leave without any penalties. They could get up and leave the classroom and it didn't count against them when it came to attendance. Now, this professor was known for being late, you know, roughly around 10 minutes or so, five, 10 minutes walking into class anyhow. But what these students figured out, how, I don't know, you know, you've been students once, you can figure out how they were doing it sitting around one day, but this is one that had those old clocks. Remember those old clocks that would be on the wall that were literally wired in, you know, electrical that were wired in there, where it had the one minute that would tick, you know, and then 60 seconds, tick, would go the next one, and you could sit there and literally watch it work itself around. They found out somehow that if you picked up an eraser and threw it at it, they could make it jump a minute and jump a minute. So what they would do, they would pick up the racers and throw it at the clock and boom, 15 minutes, prof ain't here and they would leave. This happened several times throughout the semester. Then comes finals, where the prof decides to get even. Prof walks into the class with their finals, everyone's seated, he passes them out, face down, and he says, look, okay, here's the rules to this. I'm gonna say go. And when I say go, you can turn over your paper and you can start working. You have one hour, the clock says one o'clock, when that clock says 2 o'clock, you're done. You know where I'm going with this. And that he said, go, turned it over, and students started to watch him go around the room and pick up racers. And for the next seven minutes, he threw it at the clock till it said 2, said, turn in your papers now. And he graded them that way. And that's the grade they received on their final. Because you see, laws, laws are there to help us and protect us, but when we choose not to, guess what? They don't do any good, you know? So that's the first problem with the laws. They don't make us better people, better citizens. You know, they can modify behavior somewhat, but they can't change our heart. And the second problem that we have with, law, with laws is this, that they can't change the results of bad decisions. They can't undo the damage of bad behavior. Again, I'm going to go back to that police officer. Jumps on the car after the accident. He's putting chains on the car after the accident. Is that going to make the accident go away? Is that going to flip his car back over? No. It's not going to change the results. It's not going to undo the damage that was there. So laws, that's a fault that they have, you know, when it comes to that. It's not going to help us in those areas. It's not going to do anything with our heart. And that brings us to the third thing I want us to understand this morning, is that, yes, the law, it serves a purpose, but it's imperfect. 
laws that are given, laws that are made, they have a purpose behind them to try to help us, to try to protect us, to try to be there. But when we choose, like I said, with those faults, they become imperfect, you know. They don't do anything for the bad behavior. They're powerless to change our hearts and powerless to repair that which we have damaged. And that's true of every single law that man had written. It's even true of the law of Moses that God gave to Moses himself. That's why the Hebrew writer, he wrote these words in Hebrews 8, 7 when he was talking about that law. He said, if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, that first law that God gave to Moses, then no place would have been sought for another. In other words, God gave this law, and it was a good law, but it was imperfect. It was imperfect in that. And so it had to be replaced. And that's why Jesus Christ came. Jesus came to replace the law. What the law could not do because it was imperfect, Jesus Christ could do because he was perfect. He gave us the ability to change. To change not just our attitude, but to change our heart on the inside. He gave us the ability to heal our past, to cover our shame and our guilt so it exists no longer. And he didn't just stop there. In addition, he's given us blessing upon blessing. That's why John wrote in his gospel, in John 1, 16, he said this, From the fullness of his grace, we've all received one blessing after another. And like I said, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about what does it mean to be a biblical steward? What does it mean to be a good steward? And specifically, we've been talking about our tithes and our offerings. And as we mentioned before, our offerings on a Sunday morning, they're they're more like a free will offering that you hear when it comes to it because there's nowhere in Scripture where God dictates to us the amount that we have to give. Yes, we've studied Scripture and we've seen that God likes the tithe, that God favors the tithe. So that's a great place for us to start. It's, it's the tithe, but we are not commanded by a law to give that. All Scripture tells us about our offerings. What you did just before I came out here, when Lauren God out here and prayed, and, and what we did after that, all it tells us is about that is that we must be giving it cheerfully. We got to do it because we want to, you know, because we understand the blessings that are there, you know, and if we understand the blessings that God has given us, then our offering should reflect that. It's like, okay, well, I made 200 this week. I brought home 200, so that means, you know, by law, I got 10%. Got to write a $20 check. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to do it. Or it could be, God, thank you. You allowed me to bring home $200 this week. How much do you want? I mean, it's all yours anyhow, God. You just allowed me and gave me the ability to work, to give me the job that I have this so I could earn this. How much? Do you need 10? Do you need 20? God, do you need 90? Do you need it all? Because I believe you shall supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. So what do you need from me, God, when it comes to this? One way of giving is the law. One way of giving is the grace. And when we understand the blessing that God has given us, it shall reflect our thanksgiving in our hearts. Not because some law has told us to do that. In one church, they have a, uh, when it comes to taking up their offering, the way that they do it is, uh, you know, Lauren came out and, and, and talked to and, and everything and gave a little devotion and then had a prayer and took up the offering. In their church, they take up the offering and then the offering's brought forward and a deacon has a prayer for that. And on this particular Sunday, the deacon lick it, lift up the offering and he said this in his prayer, no matter what else we may say, Lord, this is what we actually think of you. And he wasn't saying that to put people down. He was saying that to remind people that because of that, because of what you've done for me, God, I understand the grace that I have because you gave your one and only son. I understand the blessing I have in my life and the blessings upon blessings. So God, this is what I actually think of that and this is what I actually believe that's there. And that gets hard for us to understand. But when we understand that blessing, and when we take a look at the law and when we take a look at grace within the scripture, this is what we find. When the law was given, God came down first time since the Garden of Eden, you know, but he was separated from the people. Anyone touch the mountain, what? You die. When Jesus came, God came down and, and tabernacled among us, meaning he put on flesh and he lived and walked with us. When the law was given, God came down upon a mountain, Mount Sinai. When Jesus came, God gave his grace on a mountain called Mount Zion. When the law was given, the people, you know, were to gather at the mount on the third day to hear the law proclaimed. When Jesus came, his grace was proclaimed on the third day at his resurrection. When the law was given, death came to anyone who transgressed upon the mountain. When Jesus came, death came to him because of our transgressions. 
I heard somebody put it this way. In the Old Testament, the sheep died for the shepherd. In the New Testament, the shepherd died for the sheep. The shepherd died for the sheep. And that's the difference between God's law and God's grace. You know, the law came to bring judgment and all that, which brought death. But John tells us this in John 3, 17 and 18. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Isn't that awesome? That's the blessing of grace. That's the blessing of God coming and through his son doing away with the law and allowing us to have his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his love, and his grace. And that's what we live under, his grace. And the worship team is going to come up here and they're going to continue to sing and worship while we're going to take some time of reflection where you're at to remember and rejoice. But again, I, I want to give you this picture of grace. Okay, I told you that I got a speeding ticket earlier, $75 speeding ticket, you know, and Joe, if you know Joe, Joe's a jokester. For the rest of the day, we never found the crazy spot <laughs> on top of it all. You know, we drove around with it, and Joe is always joking, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, I mean, we pulled up to this place to eat, and there was a police car, and he's like, ooh, maybe you should buy his lunch. <laughs> you know, and, and he's always, you know, pointing and poking, and I was joking, too, with him and stuff. Not as much as they were joking when it came down to it, because for me, it hurt a little bit more, because back then... I only brought home $150 a week. So that was half of a week's paycheck. That was a hard, hard hit to get that ticket. You know, so I wasn't laughing and it wasn't as jovial as Joe was, you know, and everybody else's when it came to the joking. But then when we got back to our place where we lived and we were talking and continued to fellowship and stuff like that, Joe was in the kitchen. I went in, I was talking with him. All of a sudden, Joe reached over and he handed me something. I looked down at my hand and he handed me $75. I was like, Joe, I don't, he goes, no, I don't want it. And I'm like, well, yeah, at least 25 for the way you've been joking me. I'll take 25, you know. And, uh, but he's like, no, I want to pay for it. But why? I mean, I'm the one that broke the law, not him. I knew what I was doing. I chose to speed. He didn't say, Dave, speed real quick. I chose. I'm the one that didn't like the pace of the car. I'm the one that decided to go out. I'm the one that knew the law, and I'm the one that broke the law. So why would he pay for that, you know? Did I deserve the money he gave me that day? No. He did it because he was a brother in Christ, and he loved Melinda and I. I was guilty, but he paid my debt. That is grace. For God so loved the world that what? He gave his one and only son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When we understand the gift of the grace of God that we have, then it's not about me. It's not, you see, I pick on people all the time. I don't know how many times you've heard me preach this. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, great. You're hearing it for the first time. If you've been here for several years, sorry. And that, but I tell people, you hear me say, it's not about me. This is what grace does. It's not about me. It's realizing it's not about me. You know, I, I tease the guys all the time. I'll pick on them, you know, men's night out. Hey, this is where we're going. Oh, I don't like to eat there. I don't care. <laughs> you know, and I say that really snarkly. You know, sometimes I say it in a little nicer, sometimes I point it out, but honestly, I care about those guys, but I don't care that they don't like the restaurant because it's not about them. Ladies, it's not about you. Well, I don't like that place. I don't care. Well, I don't like to do that. I don't care. Because we do what we do because it's not about you. Guys, they, they can stand up. These guys can tell you it's all the time. You don't like the restaurant? That's okay. Don't eat anything. Why do we do the men's night out? We do it so... so I can sit there and my neighbor or my coworker, and I can bring them in and, 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 you know, they can be in a more comfortable setting, maybe not as threatening as coming into church on a Sunday, not knowing what to do on a Sunday morning, but, the, you know, we know what to do at restaurants, guys, <laughs> eat, you know, and that, and they go there and they have fun and they joke, and, and like I picked on Gary in first service, I'll pick on him again, you know, then when they come to church, then after that, they can say, oh, there's that guy that eats three desserts, <laughs> you know, and stuff, and they feel more comfortable because they've had that connection, that's why we do what we do, I don't pick a restaurant because I like it, because Lauren likes it, Gary likes it, George likes it, Clint likes it. That's not why I pick it, you know? And that's what I mean when I talk about we understand what we do. When it comes to grace, we do what we do, not because it's what we want to do. We do because this is what we believe God is asking of us. So God, what do you want me to do? Because you gave me your son more than I could ever ask for. You love me in ways I could never, ever imagine. So because of that, what do you want me to do? All I am and all I have is yours, God. How do you want me to use it for you today? That's what I want us to remember now as we get ready to take some time and reflect. 
as you get ready to sit where you are and the worship team comes out here and continues to, to, to lead us in song, we're going to have this time where we remember before we take the elements. We're going to have this time that we get to rejoice because God did give us his son. And we can remember what that beautiful grace has done for us. And that, and as you take some time and as you're sitting there reflecting, when, whenever you're ready, the elements will be at the tables. You can just, whenever you're ready to get up and go and serve yourself, if you're unable to do that, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring it to you. But also during that time, if there's something that you realize, it's like, wow, you know what? I've been living by the law and I need to step out in faith and I need to, I need to accept the grace of God, the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God into my life. Maybe that's a decision you want to make today. I don't know. But if there's something in your life after you're sitting there reflecting and the Holy Spirit speaking to you and there's a decision you want to make, if there's a recommitment you want to make, if there's prayer that you need, I'm going to be up in the front row. Come on up here. And if people are with me, keep coming. We have other leadership. If that's what you feel comfortable doing while everyone's taking communion and, and remembering and reflecting, you can come on up here and be with me. But let's go before God and just give him thanks right now. Father, I thank you for this time that we can come in your presence. We can come together corporately and worship you and give thanks to you because you've given us something we can never, ever imagine, your son. That kind of love, we praise you for that kind of love that you pour out to us. The passion that you have to want to be a part of our lives each and every day. Father, that's so hard for us to grasp, but yet it's still there. Whether we understand it, know it, believe it or not, you are there. Your love, your mercy, and your grace, and we praise you for that. And I pray, Father God, as we take this time and we remember and we reflect and we rejoice over the gift of your Son, Father God, that your Spirit will speak to our hearts. Help us to look. Help us to see. Help us to understand. Are we living by grace or are we still under the law? Have we submitted to you or are we looking at rules? Father God, may your Spirit fill us with that wisdom and in the strength, Father God, to do what we need to do for you. Thanks again for this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.